Restaurant Unstoppable episode 706 with Dean Small. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Dean Small, my man Dean. Are you feeling unstoppable today? Unstoppable. (laughs) Yes. So Dean Small is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, where he went on to apprentice for two years at Windows on the World. In 1985, Dean became director of culinary development and purchasing manager at El Torito Restaurants, which operated more than 220 units and 12 restaurant concepts with operations grossing over $420 million. And that's going back in 1985. It's Pretty good. Uh, In 1988, Dean founded Synergy Restaurant Consultants to provide innovation and efficiency strategies to restaurants and food manufacturers. Since then, Synergy has been a food and beverage and operations resource to over 225 national restaurants, chains, and independent operators. I cannot wait to dive into your story, but let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? Well, I always tell my clients, you only know what you know. Yes. And what does, how does that resonate with you? Why, why did you choose that quote for today? Because, you know, most people are not born restaurateurs. They're not born chefs. And they have their journey mm. of life experiences. Some people's life experiences have not been as broad and as deep as others. And because we live on the road and we've been doing this for 30 years, we just bring this ex- extraordinary breadth of knowledge and expertise to the table so when we say you only know what you know oftentimes your uh, your base of knowledge can be limited and what we're here to do is sort of help you expand that and see things in a different way i love that you started with that because i always say you don't know what you know yes. <laughs> mm. uh and the only like the more you learn the more you realize you don't know anything too which is the funny thing right you think the more you learn the, the better off you're gonna be which is true but it also can be like whoa i didn't realize how ignorant I was getting started but I think ignorance can be bliss sometimes because if you knew then you probably would never start in the first place sometimes when you <laughs> ignorance is bliss and yeah. those people that recognize that they they don't know yeah those are the smart ones yeah because then they reach out for help yeah but when you think you have all the answers in this um, hyper competitive uh, technology now driven industry you realize that you don't know as much as you need to know uh, to be able to be competitive. I love it, man. Great way to get this thing started. So here we're, we're here to talk today about the eight ways to be more profitable in the restaurant industry. But before we dive into that, I want to get to know you a little more. So take us into your, your journey. Uh, when did you know that food and beverage was going to be your, your path for life? Because graduate of CIA, so you must have had a pretty good understanding of where you were headed early on, right? Well, it's funny. Back you know, when I was uh, growing up, we didn't have the internet. So I, I only knew what I knew, <laughs> and it wasn't that much. Yeah. And um, through my college years, I sort of worked in restaurants, but um, I, I got this passion for skiing when I was in college, and uh, at one point in my life, I just wanted to be a ski bum. I used to read ski magazines thinking, God, I'd love to live in a ski area. And then I just decided that I was going to leave. And here you are in, in California. Newport, California. Yes, but I left California when I was uh, 21. I left New York when I was 21, where I grew up. And uh, I moved to Colorado, and I ended up in Aspen, Colorado. Okay. So I was in a ski area. And so I, w- I would ski in the daytime, and then I had the opportunity to work in some very cool, innovative restaurants in the evening. And because it was a very affluent community and people had money, um, so they would spend it you know, um, in restaurants, um, living, uh, you know, uh, their lifestyle, mm-hmm. which oftentimes was, you know, um, you know, loaded with, loaded, loaded with <laughs> numerous Privilege choices, yeah. <laughs> privileges of where you want to dine, what you want to drink. Yeah. So I sort of learned, how, I learned a, sort of how to cook, you know, working in restaurants there. And then I sort of honed my skills and I decided that, hey, this was something I really enjoyed. I got a lot of pleasure out of it. I loved, I loved the, the camaraderie in the restaurants and, and I decided that this could be my calling, and I decided to, you know, research a little bit further. I found the Culinary Institute of America. How old are you at this point? I'm curious. I'm old. <laughs> no, not not now, but like oh. at this point in your story. <laughs> well, back then, I see when I um, when I was in Aspen, I went back. So that was like I was probably 24, yeah, 24, 25 years old. I can't help but notice the trend of people who just make this decision to go to culinary school in their mid to later 20s mm-hmm. uh, that come out way more successful. I really don't recommend people go straight in after high school. 
Well, a lot of ki- a lot of people do, and they don't have those life experiences. Uh, you know, having worked in restaurants, exactly. and being uh, in, around other like-minded people, a more mature mark, a more mature uh, you know workforce, you might say. Um, you know, you b- just build these bonding relationships, and that's really what really kind of got me gravitated to the industry is just a sense of family. It's like an extension yeah. of your family. I think that's probably the same reason. I, I love the people in this industry. I mean, that's why I do what I do. I want to take care of these people. So yes. I can totally resonate with that. Yeah. Um, so you go to the CIA. Uh, any key mentors or maybe any key mentors in your early days that really helped put you on this right path? You know, there have been a lot of chefs that uh, that I developed a, re- a personal relationship because I was a little bit older when I went to school versus somebody coming right out of high school going to the culinary at that point I was 25 years old so my life experiences were different than uh, many you know young 18 year old uh, students so I was able to build those types of relationships but when I worked at the World Trade Center which was the busiest restaurant in the world windows uh, on the world wi- yeah windows on the world the, the chef and I built a, a really interesting relationship because he was a skier I was a skier and he just kind of kept his eye on me and then when the opportunity kind of presented itself he moved me along very quickly in my culinary path and um, this is a restaurant that would do 1,200 dinners every single mm. night. It was massive. You're going to be doing something right to stand out in a restaurant like that. So paint the picture of what you were doing to, to draw his attention, what we can emulate in our lives to get the uh, attention of people that can help us. Grow, grow well, so, you know, sometimes it's just uh, an, an opportunity just kind of presents itself. Uh, I always showed up to work on time. I was always very really nice to everybody. But there was one incident that happened in the restaurant, and um, – you know, one, one guy walked out. They had a fight with the chef and the owner. And the chef looked around at his options in terms of who he was going to move into this position. <laughs> he looked at me pitting olives and he said, you, <laughs> come over here. Move, work with Mr. Chang. He's going to teach you how to make souffles. Nice. And so that became, that really was kind of like the jumping off point of um, my journey in terms of really fast tracking my knowledge and experience and education um, because the opportunity presented itself. But uh, sometimes timing is everything. So your time here, the best restaurant in the world at the time, Windows on the World, mm-hmm. what are the key lessons that stand out to you? How did this this experience transform you as a professional? Well, having the opportunity to move quickly from different stations, from um, the dessert, the patisserie area, which is kind of the station that I managed for like five or six months, making 50, 60 souffles every single night, decorating wedding cakes, decorate, you know, just high volume. It, it gave me a real understanding about productivity, production, organization, and things like that. And the chef was one of those guys that was European. He was Swiss. So it was always kind of like pushing and pushing and pushing. And it made me work faster and think about my job a little bit differently. And then because of the fact that I was so committed to this and I went to school for it, that he saw the... Um, my tenacious attitude about wanting to learn. So he moved me into other stations. So by the time I left, I had worked every station, you know, in the restaurant and for two years. Every day it was, uh, well, it was a two-hour commute every day, taking the subway, wow. taking the taking a bus. Because you're coming from Poughkeepsie, right? Well, or- when I was doing my, um, my externship, I was working weekends at the World Trade Center, but then I took an extended externship and then I stayed like another nine months. Okay. So it gave me about two years all in uh, working down there. So what did, like if you can distill us down to like a couple lessons, things that they, that they instilled into you. I know you're we're going back to like 1978 or something like that or like early 80s, late 70s. So it might be hard for you to, to reflect and pull back one or two um, key lessons. But like how would you say you transformed the most during this time? How, who, how did this make you better, this experience? Um, I think two ways. One, the diversity of the, the staff. Yeah. Okay. The you know the different types of people. New York is a very diverse city. Yeah. And so you're working with everything from different sexualities. You're dealing with different races, different uh, ethnic ethnic people. Um, their cultures, cultures in, general. Cultures in yeah. general. How to communicate with them and how to get along with them and how to work in a kind of a harmonious way because everybody's sort of dependent on each other. So that was a, that was a big one. So how do you do that? Pull back another layer. Like, w- like what is your approach to that? Uh, working harmoniously with multiple different perspectives and opinions. Well, you have to respect everybody. Mm. And uh, coming from you know Aspen, living in a kind of a diverse area there too. Not not like New York City, but. Uh, that just kind of gave me 
perspective of just how you have to work as a team to be able to uh, achieve greatness. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're all 99.9% exactly alike, you know, it, it, as far as our DNA goes. Like, we're all pretty much exactly the same, and, and we function the same. We are, like, the, the inner workings of our brain, you know, mm-hmm. emotionally, we function the same. Yeah, and it's temperament, too, mm-hmm. because in a busy restaurant like that, it can get heated, mm-hmm. it can, you know, voices start to uh, to rise, you know, there's a lot of pressure in terms of just putting out that much food mm. and doing it fast and um, doing it accurately. Yeah. That's the other thing. Cause yeah. Being a Swiss chef uh, that the executive chef was, very demanding mm. in terms of the plating, uh, the little details. And if you know you could not meet that expectation, he'd let you know it. Yeah. And then we kind of skimmed over this. Or I don't even know if I mentioned it. You also had the um, privilege of working for the Rockefeller family. Um, I'm sure you weren't. I'm sure you weren't directly like next to like Mr. and Mrs. Rockefeller. Well, I mean, they're at this point there, it would be their, their, uh, descendants, I'm assuming. Right. Or they, no, it was, was, was it them? Yeah. Were they around it was, yeah absolutely. Okay. It was Nelson. Um, okay. And, um, he would enter, he had an estate in Terrytown. It was the Rockefeller estate. Okay. And, uh, he would have a lot of dignitaries, a lot of guests that were okay. always there. So, uh, one of my, uh, col- one of my culinary buddies and I, uh, were, um, were recruited to prepare uh, food for them on weekends. So on a Saturday and Sunday, sometimes Friday afternoon when you have to school, we would go down to the estate and we would start preparing based on the number of guests that were gonna be there. And we would prepare the food, serve the food, do the wine service, we did it all. And uh, it was just a tremendous experience just to kind of spend time with talking to Henry Kissinger and I think his wife's name was Sandy and their dog. I mean, just it was was just, you know, uh, one of those very, unique experiences in my life and um, I cherished it. I mean, I, I can only imagine being around that many successful people, um, being in the company or just in the presence of that many successful people. Did you notice anything about that's like about how they presented themselves, any like lessons that you took that you applied to your own life? No, they were very warm and friendly and welcoming and they were just so thrilled to be there and not maybe be in the city <laughs> where they were being surrounded by paparazzi mm. and people trying to, you know, take pictures of them or, uh, they liked the comfort of their surroundings and the fact that they had these two culinary guys, yeah. you know, cooking for them. And they would spend most of their time in the kitchen just talking to us, uh, wanting to know us. That's cool. That's a lesson right there. I think yeah. the power of taking your time, not to make it about you, but to make it about everybody else, right? And to get to know the person that's across from you. Yeah. It was yeah. A lot of fun. Um, okay. So moving on from your time at Windows on the World, uh, you get this great opportunity with, uh, I forgot the name of the group, um, the, the 250. El Torito. Yes, thank you very much. Um, how did you how did you land this experience? Well, actually, there was a couple of stops before. That. Anything worth mentioning? Well, um, I moved back to Aspen after uh, Windows on the World, and I decided that. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, during my time at Windows on the World, my uh, my colleague and I, my buddy, we entered the professional pineapple cooking contest. Okay, it was the biggest. Um, it was the biggest cooking contest at the time. It was like $55,000. $55, Are you actually cash. cooking pineapples? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was sponsored by Dole, so it was to use canned pineapple. So we, we leveraged some of our knowledge from our experience at the culinary, and we entered, I think, like 10 or 12 recipes. Took photos of them. We never entered anything before. We figured, what the hell? Yeah. You know, $55,000, what do we have to lose? Yeah, let's have fun. Well, we were chosen as yeah. finalists. Nice. Yeah, so um, they flew us to Hawaii for the cook-off, and so we had one recipe that we got, it was entered, and lo and behold, person sitting behind me on the flight from New York to Hawaii is the executive chef at Windows on the World. Oh. Yeah, so he's one of the judges. Okay, that helps. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh, no, it's, okay. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was just a lot of fun. We didn't win, so uh, we decided to, uh, at the end, to drown our sorrows in uh, pina coladas, and we flew to Maui, and we kind of hung out there for a week trying to figure out our future. What is our life going to look like and now? We're both like 25 years old. Is there a old. better place in the world to lose something, though? <laughs> it, it, ex- exactly. Yeah. And as I, I was telling my, my buddy at the time, we're sitting on a, kind of a bridge in Lahaina talking through our, our lives. What are we going to do? And, and, and our, what's our next chapter going to be? I mean, we've already graduated school. What do we want to do? And I, uh, I, I painted a picture for him, a picture of what it would be like. Hey, what are we, why don't we both move to Aspen? Um, I know it. Let's start a business. Let's start a catering business. There's a oh, tremendous nice. 
been a, a tremendous amount of affluent people. They have big homes. They like to party. There's yep. no, they'd rather be in their home drinking their wine. So I think we can do this. You have a network there established already? Not really, no? but driven and knew that if we could figure this out, we could we could get this going. We just needed enough seed money, you know, under $10,000 to kind of get this sorted out. Mm-hmm. And I uh, borrowed some money. And uh, my buddy Tom and I, we, we went back to New York. We packed up all of our things. We moved back out to Aspen. And we opened up a, a catering business and a bakery at the same time. Okay. And so we were doing high end catering to people like Lucille Ball, the Bee Gees, Dang. Diana yeah. Ross, uh, Robert McNamara, just a lot of celebrities who had homes in Aspen or Snowmass. And then uh, we had a bakery and we used to bake all of our uh, all the breads for and some of European desserts and for the restaurants, the local restaurants. And then we did wedding cakes. But our catering business grew and grew and got really very successful. We did all our own charcuterie, pâtés, galantines, valentines, ice carvings. We, we were really, we were sort of like, at the time, we were the bomb. We nice. were the best thing in Aspen <laughs> if you wanted high-quality catered food. So why did you stop? We had two consecutive years of no snow. Oh. Yeah, and a ski area. And at that time, Jimmy Carter was the president, and we had hit 22% interest rates. It was brutal. It was almost like the financial meltdown in 08 to 2010. No snow, no, no customers, money. Yeah. no money. You know, um, so I was. We were fortunate enough, and besides having the bakery, we had a restaurant and we had a kind of a, a specialty food store in Snowmass. So we had three businesses at the time. We had the opportunity to basically sell what we could, and we had to move on. It's one of those things. It's a timing. Happen, yeah, it's, it happens in your life. It's it's a um, it's your next journey in your life. So I was recruited at that point to El Torito yeah. in California. So I moved to California in 85 to take on that position as director of food service and supply chain manager. So this is your first role, um, at, well, aside from owning businesses, as first role managing a large group of restaurants. Well, uh, we say- Or managing, management or in an in a, in a executive position. True. True. I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been self-employed. Yeah. There's only been a few times I've actually worked for a lot so of people. That must have been tough then, transitioning to the, being an employee. Well, at El Torito, yeah, it was. How it did w- you deal with that? You know, it had its challenges, but I, I looked at it as a opportunity to learn things that I didn't know before. Mm. I mean, I was exposed to, to, to foods I was not familiar with. I traveled a lot. I got the opportunity to see things I never would have seen. Had I worked um, in, a, say, a restaurant, um, because we had restaurants um, from here to Florida and Texas, uh, up to Pacific Northwest, I was, I was traveling, I was seeing other restaurants, so it just broadened my mm. knowledge. But then on the supply chain side, because we were such a big organization, um, I had the opportunity to work with some of the biggest brands in the world in developing customized products, or seeing their facilities, or being on the floor at these evisceration facilities, buying five million pounds of beef a year, wow. five million pounds of chicken. I mean, I bought <laughs> we bought a lot of products, so yeah. we were not we weren't just like dealing with like a distributor. We would be going to the manufacturing or the kill facility where food was actually being harvested or being produced to uh, do quality assurance checks. Mm. So it just gave me a tremendous amount of knowledge of how the industry works, how supply chain works, how how you negotiate yeah. deals because one of the things that we pride ourselves on is on the um, on the efficiency side is knowing how to how to work with distributors to get the most favorable markups i think that might be a transferable skill across all levels of restaurants simply how to negotiate not necessarily the details but how to communicate with a person to negotiate on your favor any nuggets you can pull from that to share with us before we start to transition to uh, I don't want to put you on the spot either. You can yeah. choose anything you want to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Well, most uh, most operators that we run into, whether they be independent operators or even regional chains, as I said, you only know what you know. You know, they believe that they have a good deal with their their distributor. Pick the distributor, U.S. Foods, um, Cisco, or whomever it is, and they're being told that they by the by the distributor you have the best deal, mm. and I'm giving you cost plus. Okay, you always know what the plus is, but you never know what the true cost mm. is. Okay, and that's where operators kind of shoot themselves in the foot. So if you don't understand 
what the true cost of goods is, then you're really not in control of your destiny. And most operators don't understand the nuances of supply chain. So they leave at least one and a half to two points on the table because they don't understand not only the, the skill sets of, t of negotiating, it, but what they should be negotiating for. Mm. Should you be negotiating price per pound, price per case, and understanding the, just the, the whole mechanism of how to, um, how to achieve better cost of goods. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna be able to unpackage that all right now, but is there, is there a resource or a place to go to get started to, to start educating yourself and to become more knowledgeable on this? Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that I could point to a book and say, read this. For us, it just comes with decades of experience seeing um, everybody's, um, uh, their order guides and seeing what everybody's paying for, um, for food and all the t programs that we put together. So we get a sense of that you're overpaying because we know what the deal is from all these other companies that we're working with. If you're getting, getting the short end of the stick or if you really get fair pricing. Okay, so you spent three years with El Torito, correct? Yes. Um, what made you want to leave? It seems like you probably had a pretty secure situation going on for yourself at this restaurant group. Um, no, yes? You know, um, back in the eight, mid 80s, there was a lot of consolidation, a lot of LBOs, leverage buyouts taking place. El, El Torito went through two LBOs when I was there. So when, when, the, when there's a leverage buyout, the management takes over, they buy out the debt, and oftentimes there's a restructuring. So my department was restructured many times because I had 12 people working for me, I had, uh, what we call regional chefs. So you never know, as we're trying to cut costs, you know, to be able to pay back the debt, how it, it's all gonna shake out. So I felt like I was at that point in my career that I learned about as much as I was going to learn at El Torito. I probably didn't have much more of a path forward. And I've always wanted to get back into get that uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, very entrepreneurial. Yeah. And I felt like, hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any major obligations. If there was ever a time to try to break through, to break out, and try this, this was this was the time. Mm. And because we did, a, uh, I was, we did a lot of work with national account operators, so like Nabisco's of the world, the Chiquitas, the uh, Garden Burgers, those types of companies, uh, not not those specific companies, but those style of companies. We were keenly, I was keenly aware of the, where the void was in the market in terms of the national account guy um, that would be calling on me. He really did not know my menu. He did not know my restaurants. He didn't know our brand. You know, he was trying to sell Oreo or he was trying to sell A1 or whatever the case may be. And I felt that there was a void in the marketplace where if I could liaise with between the national account manager and the chain, I could be a strategic resource to them to help them uh, introduce new ideas around their product to national chains. And that took off. Mm. That was very, very successful. So, so the, the lesson here, I think, is look for a void. Look for an opportunity. Look for a way to be of value to others. The white space. Yeah. I would call it the white space. And, and I found that white space. And because there was nobody else doing what I was doing and that had the relationships that I had, uh, I was the perfect fit. Plus, I was a CIA grad, so I had all of this culinary credibility coming into working with the national account manager on behalf of a, uh, a national brand. Beautiful. And so I was very fortunate. I, my first two clients were Nabisco and Chiquita, and they kept me very, very busy. And while I wanted to do more restaurant consulting work, I was able to build that base of my business and at the same time start picking up projects from independent, uh, nas actually national restaurants okay. would hire me. And this is around the time um, Synergy Restaurant Consulting was formed? 80, 88, 88 uh, 89 was when we really started getting traction. So it wasn't like a, I think sometimes people, when they, they think of business, to start a business, it's like hitting a switch and everything is like has to be in place. But it's usually more of a pendulum swing. It's start where you can, do what you can, and slowly work, like, accelerate into it while having you know it starts as your side hustler right while having a full-time job and you slowly start to work your way oh, oh you, you work your way away from the full-time to transition towards the the part-time is that yeah. kind of what happened here? sort of you know as an entrepreneur you, you know you're always you're looking at your business and you're and thinking to yourself what's my nut every month if I can cover my nut every month and I can get to X Y or Z I can be doing really well so if you know what this is what I need to survive and I was you know most entrepreneurs when they start they're they are in survival mode yeah you know unless you have a, a big bankroll behind you and once you understand 
where the baseline is of where and when you can start making money, then it's really very helpful. Yeah. So I knew where mine was. I had a very low bar. As long as I could hit X, cover a mortgage, cover car payment, cover some basics, yep. I could be successful. I just needed some runway. Yeah, and this is a key lesson and a lot of things people don't realize. you got to pay yourself first. got to make sure you're taking care of yourself and that you can sustain your needs, your life needs, before you go into business because you don't want to get to that situation where you don't get what you need because then you won't be able to sustain the business if you can't sustain yourself. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Beautiful lesson. Thank you. So my listeners might be thinking right now, Eric, why are you going so fast? You're like fast forwarding through this interview because typically I'll, I'll go slower, I'll pull back layers and I'll try to get these nuggets. But we have eight uh, ways to be more profitable that in a restaurant industry. So the way I'm thinking about this is when you get these clients who approach you who say, hey, Dean, we need help. We need to make more money. How do we do that? This is what you're looking for. This is how you, these eight things are the things that you're doing that you're you're focusing on to see if you can't help generate more profit and revenue for these these restaurants. Is that what's safe to say? Safe to say. All right, cool. So we're gonna take a quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to start unpackaging these eight ways to be more profitable in the restaurant industry. We'll be right back. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. All right, we are back, and now we're about to cover the eight ways to be more profitable in the restaurant industry. So, when these companies are approaching you, like how do they typically do it? Okay, so oftentimes people have a need. They just they just wake up one day. They say, "I cannot continue doing this anymore. I'm not making any money. I'm working 70, 80 hours a week, and at the end of the year, there's nothing left." Mm -hmm. So they have to first decide, "Hey, I need some help." So they'll probably go out and they'll do a search for restaurant consultants. So we have a very high SEO ranking. If you search restaurant consultants, yep. we typically uh, show up on the first page. Um, we have, we're rich with content. So uh, we'll get on the phone and we'll listen to what they have to say, what their issues are. And oftentimes it's the same common denominators. You know, they're having turnover. Um, they're, they're getting poor Yelp scores because of consistency, their labor is very high, but that's relative to sales, and they're just not making any money. And what we'll provide them with is a, a solution, which basically starts, let me come in and do a holistic assessment of your operation. Let me take a good look under the hood. Let me observe a, a, in, a, in an objective way. Let me look at your food, taste your food, look at your hospitality, assess the brand positioning, how the restaurant is structured, and then I can give you some very concrete ways to make improvements and identify what we call the low-hanging fruit. So that is typically what an engagement looks like, and then we probably walk them through this, these eight points uh, that are relative to um, improving the financial performance of their restaurant. Okay, so let's just dive right into it. The first thing I have on my list that you gave me is brand positioning is being the first thing that you guys try to identify. So what do you mean by brand positioning? So a brand is a promise. It's a set of expectations, okay? you Everybody has their favorite brands that they love. You might like Starbucks, but somebody else might like Pete's. Somebody else might like uh, um, Seattle Best, right? But you're loyal to your brand. Why? It makes you feel a certain way. It delivers against a certain expectation. It provides you with a certain type of experience that you like. So we always start with, okay, tell me about your brand. Tell me about your brand, your values of your brand. What's your brand promise? Every brand has a promise, whether it's Apple or Starbucks or BMW or, you know, name the brand, right? So oftentimes brands, people think of brands, oftentimes people think a brand is a logo or it's a graphic or it's a name. It's not. It's a set of expectations mm. that you create for your guests, okay? So we always like to start, well, okay, um, not everybody in the white pages is for your brand. So we need to define, first off, who is your core customer, Okay, and it's not an age group anymore. It used to be, well, it's a demographic. No, not really. It's more of a psychograph. Yes, yes. I'm so happy you said that's exactly the word that was in my mind. Sorry. Keep it's going. a it's a state of mind. It's I want this type of an experience. Oh, and Eric's restaurant provides that type of experience better than anybody else. Yeah. I like Eric, and he always makes me feel a certain way. Yes. So, I go to Eric's restaurant. So we have to decide. Well, who is our core customer? Right. Then we say to ourselves, okay. What do these people need? What do they want and what do they expect? 
So if your core customers are millennials, okay, uh, that are really in your trade area, that you really can attract, but your food is not consistent with what millennials like to eat because you have an older clientele that's coming to you, but the problem with an older clientele, unfortunately, they're going to start coming to you less and less because eventually they're going to yeah. pass on yeah. and then you won't have that next generation of customers. The way, guess. the way I like to think of psychographics is when I go here, mm. what do others think about me? Like, how does this associate with my personal brand and what I say about myself? Is that aligned with who I am? And people, if, if, if they go to your restaurant and it doesn't align with who they think they are, they're not going to come back because they don't want to be, a, they want, is that safe to say? Is that one way to look the, at it? Yes. And so everything that you do about your brand is, is a promise. So that means your design, your decor, your menu has to be in alignment with what your brand and your promise is. So then we have to ask the third question is, okay. Now that we know who the core customer is, we've identified it's this psychographic type of person, so, and this is what they need, what this is what they want, and this is what they expect. And we say what they need. Hey, I need really high quality food that's you know healthier and is GMO free or uh, that has gluten free options. And this is what I uh, this is what I expect, and it's going to be done in a timely manner when I go there to eat. If it's going to take 25 minutes for lunch, I can't come to you because I don't have 25 mm. minutes for lunch. I have to get back to work. So. At lunchtime, we always say it's about speed, value, and convenience. So if you can't deliver that at lunch, then that becomes a problem for that particular target market yes. who needs speed, value, who, who's a lunch customer, okay? And the third question is, what can you be better at than anybody else? Yes. What, what can you own? What's, you, what's ownable, defendable, quantifiable? Unique selling that, proposition. What's, what's your superpower? Yeah. What's, your, what's your secret sauce that makes you better than everybody else that... Everybody can celebrate and rally around because if you don't have that, that's a problem because if then you're in, you're in that what I call the sea of same. You're like everybody else. You've got chicken wings. They've got chicken wings. You've got a quesadilla. They've got a quesadilla. You have not clearly defined your brand. You have what I call Me Too food. Yeah. There's a great book around this topic by Seth Godin called Purple Cow. Maybe you're familiar with it. That kind of talks about just being something – like unique, you need that unique selling proposition. You need to be best, the best at something. Exactly. Um, I can't help but think about uh, Ramsey uh, or Crimsey Ramsey, who I just recently had on the show. And um, the reason why I'm thinking about her is, well, one, I just literally interviewed her the day ago. But she, I think one thing that's really important for my listeners to the to think about it, if there's one thing that you really want to do, like your thing is, for example, vegan Cajun food, right? And you're you want to create the first vegan Cajun food restaurant. Where are you going to go that, that that are you willing to relocate to the place where that's going to work? And that's what Crimsey did. She was living I think she from um, she was living in Texas, Dallas, Texas at the time. And she knew that if she was going to do this one thing, she had to go to where the market was going to support that. Uh, and for her, that was L.A. because vegan and outside the box, unique and it's taking off for her. So I think it's just a really good example of how important your demographic is and, and your brand positioning is. And are you willing to relocate to where it will have wings and where it will take off? Is that something you want to reflect on? Well, exactly. If you're opening up a vegan restaurant, you don't want to do it in the middle of a carnivorous neighborhood. Yeah. Right? <laughs> where all the, all the, you know, where people... Maybe not are, Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> right, because yeah. that's not your target market. Yeah. So you, that's a classic example of understanding who's your customer yeah. and then making sure you put... You know, if you're going after this type of an individual that thinks about beer, okay, about a certain way, you probably don't want to open up in um, certain areas of Utah, mm. okay, because they don't drink, mm -hmm. uh, so you don't get, you won't have beer sales. Yeah, it's as simple as that. So it really is making sure that you you understand your product and and or the product that you want to sell relative to the, to the market that you're in. Okay. Are there any other key uh, positions on this first element that we're going to talk about that we haven't gotten to yet? I want to cut you short. Yeah. Well, uh, with branding, you know, everything that you do, uh, all your messaging needs to be on brand so that people really understand what you stand for. So uh, whether it be in social media, uh, how you communicate your message, how you, how you communicate your, you have two customers. You have your internal customer, which is your employees and your team, and then you have your external customer, which is your guests that come in the door. It's really important that everybody understands what your brand promise is so that everybody can live those core values of what you're all about. Otherwise, you find yourself um, where really nobody understands what what's our purpose, So how why can are we, we here. What can we start doing to make sure people know what that is? 
in terms of your brand purpose? Yeah, you're, you, the, the, the make sure that the brand is being communicated efficiently throughout the business, all parts. Well, every restaurant should have a, a set of like a mission statement. What are our, what are our core values? Mm-hmm. What do we really believe in? What's important to us? And then we should live those core values yes. every single day. Yes. And that should be part of our internal communication to, when we do lineup meetings and things like that and reward those people yes. on a daily basis for living those values because they're your ambassadors to uh, to your guests. Yeah, and this is key right here. I recently spoke to Mario Del Perro. He calls them their, their brand rituals. And I had a Hurt Schultz on the show from the Ritz Carlton, and they do their 24 standards of service. Every day they cover one standard. And when they go through the 24, they start at back at one. And it's it's not enough to write these things down and say this is who we are. You have to live them every day and the and way you live them, them yep and that you have to work it into your pre-meetings it has to be a part of your culture echoing every day and i think that's where people fall short they don't bring it to the surface constantly agreed yep. agreed they gloss over it. and a lot of times you know these things are done they're done from the hip without a real strategy behind it. put these things make make a checklist mark like that that these things get covered every day because you it's not enough to write it down you gotta live it i think that's right. we can probably stop there and move on to the next point or do you, sure. you want to unpackage anything else sure okay cool so number two on the list is guest experience emotional connection what do you mean by that when the guest pulls in the parking lot Sorry, I should have given you more time to take your sip. (laughs) When the guest pulls in the parking lot, they park their car, and they start walking to your restaurant, how do you want to make them feel? Is that parking lot clean? Is there clutter everywhere? Is the glass clean? Okay. Is the sign working? Okay. Um, Are the lights on at at the right level? And when you walk in the door, what should they feel? What should they see? What should they smell? Do you smell food? Okay, or do you smell cleaning supplies? Mm. Okay, so I th- I think people connect with brands on an emotional level. That's what drives frequency and drives loyalty. Oftentimes, when restaurants uh, when uh, guests walk in the door, they'll be greeted by a, a greeter or a hostess. Oftentimes, they can be very young. Okay, they have not built up the life skills to be able to communicate effectively with let's say an older an older guest, or their heads down, or they're looking at something else as opposed to the guest. How you make people feel when they walk in the door, it's all starts, it all starts there. I could tell you stories where we've got clients where they know everybody's they know everybody's name. And knowing hearing your name goes a long way in making you feel a certain way about that restaurant. And I've got clients, not only do they know their name, they they the second generation, there's hugs. Yeah. Okay. And that just connects. The, people want a, f- a little recognition. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot of effort. So, give me three things that will have the biggest impact when it comes to making an emotional connection. What are the three things? Unless there's more you want to unpackage there, but if we can get some sp- specific things that we can do right now in our business, at least three to start making that emotional connection. What are they? One, if you made a focus of having every guest or uh, your team know every guest's name to the best of their ability. So when you take the order, can I have your name? And you write their name down when you take their order for who got the chicken piccata. So when I'm serving the chicken piccata, say, Eric, here's your chicken piccata. You'll be amazed. The fact that I knew your name, you want to hear your name. Called. Yeah, I, there's a something somebody said once. I can't remember where I heard this, but everyone's favorite word is their name. Yes, yes it, it is. Yeah, it is the simplest thing you could do. And if you make that effort to know your guest's name, guarantee you, you will see a bump in uh, sales. So you just gave us one thing uh, that we can start doing to uh, practice this, knowing the name. But are there any other best practices? The best mat- practices around learning names. You you um. That's the best one okay. is, is when you're taking the order, may I have your name, okay? And when you check in, make sure that you get their name, yeah. okay, which is very, very important. So another great tip is, you know, the manager, you live and die by the success of your manager and your manager's commitment to being on the floor and coaching and mentoring and working with the team. But that manager should go around to every table and build a personal relationship yes. with the guest. The guest feels so welcome, so special when the manager comes up to you and say, hey, Eric, it's so good to see you again. Hey, Sharon, if that's your wife's name or girlfriend's name, or the, you know, the dog's name, they, they're so overwhelmed that you, you gave them that recognition that they bring all their friends yes. in because 
they know you. Yes. And now I'm going to introduce my friends to the manager, and then they're going to feel special. So one, know their name. Two, know who they are, the, who's behind the name. And that, well, that manager, that and manager then, is key. Is that manager is showing up to the table, showing that they really care about the guest experience. Sometimes it's just you're better customers. You know, sometimes you just you buy them dessert. Like yesterday, I was up at Toca Madero up in L.A., and I couldn't believe it. I was having the most outrageous experience with one of my clients. And we were uh, having some drinks and uh, uh, trying some different foods. And they kept just giving us different tastes of tequila because they're famous for that. They went over the top <laughs> to let us taste a bunch of tequilas we didn't even ask for, but they knew we were interested. Yeah. So, you know, they may have given us maybe a, a all in, maybe a shot, shot and a half of different tequilas to taste. That was, not only was that a special experience, but now I'm a raving fan yeah. because they went, they did it, it, it came from the heart. Yes. Yeah. And what was the name of this restaurant one more time? Uh, Toc- uh, Toco Madero. And you Toc- want to know how powerful taking care of the person across from you is? Oh my God. You just broadcasted that to 3,000 people. The next time they're in the Newport area, you know what I'm saying? It's up like, in LA, but oh, uh, still. So a super, super cool bar yeah. and restaurant. This stuff comes back. You can't track it. It's untrackable. But when you take care of people, the universe finds a way to, to come back around to reward you for that. And yeah. you, you never know in what form it's going to come from. Yep. You just got to trust. Yep. So we covered um, the knowing the name. Uh, getting your managers to know the person behind the, the name. Mm-hmm. Is there a third thing th- that you well, want to drop on us before we go to the next bullet? Sure. You know, uh, the idea of giving that guest some special recognition, just besides knowing their name, um, oftentimes we'll see, uh, well, we've made this recommendation to many chains, is that when you find out that it's a new guest, so when they check in at the guest stand, the greeter stand, uh, is this your first time visit? And they say, yes, it is. Okay, well, then that should signal to the manager that these people that are sitting on table 21 are first-timers. The manager should always go over to first-time visitors, welcome them, and then maybe give them a little welcome uh, bag. And in the welcome bag could be maybe something that might be, let's say it's a water bottle that has your branded name on it. Maybe it has some sort of bounce-back coupon. Yep. Maybe it has you know a handful of... of <coughs> something a that, koozie whatever whatever something. it yeah. is um and maybe there's a wine tasting dinner yeah. wh- what, whatever but gives them something to show a little bit of love yeah that and goes to bring them back in goes a long way goes really these people gave you maybe it's some popcorn that you make that you season you put it in a bag and it's got your special seasoning on it. nothing terribly expensive but at that point You've just endeared yourself to that guest, yeah, and they are grateful. And yeah. and the fact that you came over to them and acknowledged them, when they're thinking about going out to dinner again, they're going to be thinking of you. You're going to be top of mind. Yes, I love that. Um, so we got those three. Uh, anything else you want on package relative to guest experience and emotional connection? I'm a big fan of aroma. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was with my client up in Portland. We went to twelve restaurants. Ten of twelve restaurants we ate in. And of all the restaurants we went into, there was one restaurant as we before we walked in the door, we were getting ready to walk in. I said, "Stop!" I said, "Can you smell it?" And they go, "Yeah." I said, "What does it smell like?" So I said, "It smells great." I said, "I said that's the smell of roasted tomato." Yeah. Of of like for a great pizza place. He has restaurants, and I said, "When you go into your restaurants, you can't smell this, can you?" He goes, "No." I said, "The power of aroma." is mesmerizing yeah okay it gets people hungrier Mm. right and they crave it so there are tricks of you know creating aroma in the restaurant but whether it be walking through the restaurant with a skillet a hot skillet with a little bit of oil and rosemary and garlic and kind of perfuming the room there are a lot of little tricks like that that we share with our clients but if you can get aroma into that dining room it's a big idea. Yeah, I just I can't help but think of my recent interview with Chef Jay Kim uh, from Chilantro, <coughs> based out of Austin, Texas. And when he started as a food truck, and what he would do in the early days to went to to brand to to market himself, he'd literally take anything and just throw it on the grill just to get the smoke out, like just to bring people in. It can be so powerful. Very. Um, okay, so number three on the list: management team in executed. Sorry, management team in execution of strategy. Let's dive into that. Well, the manager is, is really the most important person in the entire team. They're the orchestrator, the conductor, 
right? So you live and die by the manager. But the reality is, is that most managers, you don't come out of the womb being a manager. And again, you only know what you know. So, you know, if you've been groomed, if you've had the, the, the good fortune to work for some of the bigger organizations like whether it be the, the Dardens, the Brinkers, the OSIs, the, uh, the Landry's organization. They really have management development programs uh, in place to kind of help groom a manager's manager so he knows how to lead the organization. So the manager is critical in terms of creating the culture, living the culture, yes. embracing the culture, and getting everyone on board to be able to be part of that, uh, that experience. So... You know, that manager is instilling values and, and, and so on. And, and it's important because then everybody's, everybody's locked and loaded. Everybody's on the same page in terms of how we should be thinking about things. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of turnover in our industry. And because managers come and go, uh, operators oftentimes think, well, the manager will create the training programs or the manager will do this. Well, again, the manager only knows what they know. It's hard to fix the bus and drive the bus at the same time. So if you don't have good protocols, systems, standards, organizational infrastructure, management tools to be able to guide the business, okay? What happens is the manager oftentimes can become more than a, nothing more than a glorified key holder and trying to keep the peace, a peacemaker, and trying to keep the restaurant staffed as opposed to really driving the business. So I use Hillstone as my, my best in class, you know, uh, experience. Um, so uh, we're a fan. Um, they're based out of uh, New York. Um, actually, they're based out of Arizona. Okay. Uh, so they operate Gulfstream across the street, Bandera, um, uh, Cherry Creek Grill, uh, R and D Cafe. It, they don't have a big menu, but it's always great. Mm. No matter no matter when you go, the time of the day, it's always the same. It's always a great experience. But they kill it on hospitality. It's like a well-oiled machine. It's just a, such a pleasure to go there because you always have a great experience because of the training. So what do they do? What is it that it's they're doing? It's commitment to training, okay? And there's a cost associated with training. And restaurants talk about training, but they don't know how to do it. So we've been developing these training programs for operators that will enable them, that are, are very affordable, that enable them to quickly train their team, okay, on the the fundamentals of uh, op of giving you know providing excellent service but if the manager doesn't have those tools in his uh, in his quiver okay it's hard for them to hold people accountable because everything becomes tribal as opposed to here is how we train this yeah. is a, this is how we greet the guests this is how we merchandise this is how we upsell this is how you know we clear tables this is how we smile. Yeah. This is our grooming. This is our look and feel that we're going for. So the management team, you know, it, it's it's critical that everybody's on the same page too. Mm. So this is why you need to have structure so that when the manager is conducting his line check twice a day, or I'm, I'm sorry, his, his alley rally or his uh, huddle up, sometimes it's called a pre-shift meeting, yeah. right? They're really... They're communicating what's important yes. in the guest experience. So management and training are critical. If you want to drive sales, you have to train your people. If they don't know the food and they can't tell you the ingredients that are in a dish or they don't know basic wine, how do you expect them to sell the wine? Mm. If they haven't tasted your food every dish over a period of some uh, time of employment, that's a problem. How can they recommend a dish? But oftentimes training is one of those things that oftentimes gets you know, overlooked because they just think, well, they'll figure it out when yeah. they're on the job. Well, there's a huge difference between trying to figure it out on the job and properly training. Yeah, we need to be empowered. Um, and I want to pull back one more layer on this. We do have five more elements to cover, and I want to make sure we get it all in in a respectful time. Sure. But like, just can you give me like the framework of what good management training training looks like? Maybe just the elements without necessarily the the deep description to respect the other five elements we have to hit. Sure. Well, a manager should have a timeline in terms of what they should be doing from the time they walk in the door to when they, when they leave. They should be always coaching, mentoring, and developing their people all the time. One. Okay. They need to be on the floor uh, actually meeting and you know, working with uh, or communicating with their guests, really developing a personal relationship. That's critical. That's, so that's number two. And then three, they should be managing their cost of goods and their labor daily 
Okay, this is a fine, you know, the restaurant business is like any other business. It's a financial model. And if you don't manage those those prime operating expenses and really understand where you are, then you're flying a little bit blind and it's hard to get to profitability. Okay, that's three. I'm going to make you recommend a tool that is best, in your opinion, these days to manage to track those those cost of goods and those numbers. What, what do you like? Out there well, um, we've just started to um, embrace this company called Jolt. Yes. And, and Jolt does, t um, they're really about scheduling. And we're really excited about uh, working with them. We have a client that just signed up for them because you can upload all of your checklists um, and so that a manager has, he doesn't have to run around with a bunch of pieces of paper and it's, and it's cloud-based. So we're a big fan of that. Beautiful. Uh, we're also a big fan of this new company we just discovered called the Expand Share. Okay. And first we're time mentioned on the show. Yeah, we're going to start developing content and uploading our management training program onto Expand Share. We're super excited about that because then it becomes a very affordable tool for restaurant operators to train their managers, so they become what we call synergy certified. Beautiful. You know, they go through our training program, so that's a great tool. Cool. The other one that I'm really excited about that uh, we just learned about just a few months ago. It's called Enjoy, and Enjoy is a gamification nice. uh, price process where it helps the employees to become fully engaged um, in the training and development program, and the manager can see um, how the employees or the, or the team is doing, if they're engaged or not engaged, and when they complete certain tasks, they get points. The more points they get, they get different levels of rewards, and it, it allows the manager during the lineup or pre-shift meeting to talk about who's killing it and creating this yeah. kind of like this, um, this com both com camaraderie but um, competition yeah. amongst the team. Learn, read the book, The Great Game of Business, if you want to learn more about the power of gamification. It could be huge. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for diving into those. Sure. Uh, so we still have four more elements to hit. The fourth one, or sorry, five more. The, four, the fourth one is menu innovation. Touch on that. So we're in the business of selling food and beverage, okay? And people come to a restaurant because they want food. But oftentimes, menus, um, they either get fatigued or they get way too big. And what happens when they get really too big, it's very difficult to be an expert in any mm -hmm. one item. Plus, it's very difficult to train when mm -hmm. you have a menu of 70, 80 items. That means you have to train somebody's how to make those 70 or 80 items. Plus, it creates a lot more labor and then... What happens is no item really stands out, okay? So we're a big fan of smaller menus, yes. but make the food not good, but make it great. Make those flavors memorable and craveable. Now, people like to see new items. They want to see menu innovation. And if your menu gets fatigued and the flavors become uh, dull or flat because the c consumer has evolved, then what happens is they guests go to other places that have more innovative food, more innovative um you know, flavors. So part of the menu innovation process is thinking about how do I, without raising prices, how do I get people to spend more money in my restaurant? Yes. So by creating new menu items that allow people to trade up to. So I'll give you an example. We have a client down here in Dana Point who has a ribeye on the menu, and it sells very well at about $34, $36, something like that. But he also sells a tremendous amount of expensive wine, you know, $80, $90, $100 bottles of wine. For a really great bottle of wine, you're probably going to pay about $70 plus for a good bottle. Um, so he was nervous about the cost of labor or the minimum wage going up and raising prices. And we said to him, don't raise prices. Let's do this. Let's change the menu mix and let's get people to spend more money. Okay. So we, we put a prime ribeye on the menu. So we went from a choice to a prime. We went from about $36 to I think maybe $48 or $46, $10 more. Yeah. It only cost us $2 more. Okay. So we had a net of $8 of eight dollars more yes so by changing the menu mix we're able to change our margins and also drive more top line sales and by doing that plus three other uh, big ideas we were able to get him a four dollar and 23 cent increase in check average per person which is huge yes huge yeah. huge so menu innovation there's a lot of ways to think about it whether it be re-engineering your current menu so it's more innovative copies more innovative it gets people to say wow that sounds pretty darn delicious yeah i think i'm going to order that that's different yeah it's a simple thing just giving somebody the choice every once in a while you're going to have that big spender come in and give them that choice if they want to get the next best thing give them that option at least put the option out there what about also just like getting giving the option of extra meat i think that's something that comes up off where somebody you have your standard sandwich but for 
three dollars more, you can get extra meat. But you're, you, does that something that you'd recommend? Like giving well, the options? Uh, you know, I think that really kind of appeals more towards a um, fast casual or, uh, like or, or to, to somebody that's like a bodybuilder or something like that. Whereas what we do is um, we recommend that you make all of your salads. We call them naked, no protein, and price them right because there's a lot of vegans, a lot of vegetarians. They don't want the chicken. So mm-hmm. how do you how do you deal with that? And then you give them the option to add on. Mm. So like this afternoon before having our meeting, I had lunch at North Italia with my my business partner and a colleague. I had a salad, and then I just added on, you know, roast chicken. Um, I could have had it without the chicken, yeah. but you know, I wanted it with. So it, I took it. I was in charge of my destiny. Yeah. I decided how much I wanted to spend. And how we speak to people has a big impact on this. Don't just assume. Like, don't assume that they only want the salad. Say which protein do you want on that. Don't even give. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think a lot of drive-throughs do this really well. Um, well, the, well, there's like I think which one is it? It's um. Starbucks does something along the lines of like, they know you're going to get a drink and what are you eating with that? And they always Mm -hmm. ask that question because they know they have an opportunity to upsell. And sometimes people aren't going in with the idea that they're going to get food, but when you give them the option, they're going to increase their odds of increasing that check average, right? Yeah. The other thing that's kind of interesting is how uh, digital, um, how iPads and Android type tablets are impacting the, the whole menu selection process. Some operators are choosing to put their menu on an iPad. Okay, whether you order off the iPad or not, it allows you to show a photograph of that mm-hmm. item, uh, maybe with a wine pairing. Yep. Tells you a little bit about the history of that item, where it might have come from. People like to see photos. Yeah. Okay. It's just the reality. It's people eat, we eat with our eyes. Yeah. So if you're able to take a take an iPad, whether you tether it to the table or not, and just give them the, the iPad, a lot of people know certain wines by the label. They don't remember, necessarily remember the name of the wine, but they remember the label. So if you're able to take a picture of the wine list, have the label, the year, a little bit about the story about it, I think it's a great tool from a menu innovation standpoint yep. to be able to communicate your message. Again, goes back and ties a little bit into that experience. It's a unique selling proposition for those who want a different experience. Yes. Uh, I think one company that I know is doing that really well is Menuvative. Um, is there is there another one that you s- can recommend if anybody's interested in that? Well, I think Stax is a is a small uh, regional restaurant chain that has a, a menu that shows all the pictures, and I think you you can order off of the iPad. Like Fleming's for years has had a digital uh, wine list, yeah, which is really very nice. That's cool. And uh, there's another there's another chain that escapes me right now, but that's the trend. Mm-hmm. You know that and did you and being able to offer order off of men, like in fast casual, these digital menu boards that are a kiosk driven, where you can kind of build your own burger, yep. you build your own bowl. You want to add chicken, you can add chicken. It gives you the option to spend more money. Mm-hmm. And what we're finding is that these digital kiosks um, operate are getting anywhere from a sixteen to twenty percent increase in check average because people are not they don't either feel intimidated or they don't feel embarrassed when they go to the counter to pick up their food and, and it has a, a churro in it or it, yeah. ha, or it has double cheese on it. You yeah, know what I mean? it's a secret. Yeah, yeah it's, are, it's personal. You yeah. know, There's no judgment. Yeah, I like that. And one other thing while we're on the topic of tablets that I've seen because it's fresh, Mendocino Farms is something a, a company that's doing this. Yep. They have somebody standing at the front door Yep. and they take your order when you as soon as you walk in, I think that's so powerful to have somebody there with a smile greet you and like I think just moving that that point of sale to the like as close to the front door so the touch point is instant mm-hmm. is is really interesting. I'm curious to see how many other people adopt this practice. Well, I think one of the reasons why they do that because they recognize that the lion's share of their business is lunch. Yeah. Okay. And I said earlier that lunch is all about speed, value, mm-hmm. and convenience. So if you can't get people in the door and get their sandwiches made in an expeditious way, you're not going to capture that lunch business. Uh, okay. So that kiosk really helps facilitate that uh, process. Beautiful. One more quick break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. We're back, and we left off on number four, so now it's time to hit number five, off-premise catering. And again, these are the eight ways to be more profitable in your restaurant industry. So if you do not have a strong off-premise catering program, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Most up, what we're experiencing today in the industry is that about 37% of all food purchased at a restaurant is consumed off-site. 
Now think about that for a second. What does that mean to the number of seats in your restaurant where you've got that much food, whether that be in third-party delivery, catering, or takeout? That is a big number, mm -hmm. okay? So you need to be thinking about, well, how do I capture some of that? A lot of the chains that are independents that we do work with are realizing upwards of an 18, 15 to 18% uh, uptick in off-premise catering. Catering is a moneymaker because you typically get about a 50% flow through. So if you're a $2 million business and you're doing you know, 20%, 20 per, 20%, that's $400,000 a year in catering. Well, you get a 50% flow through, meaning that all of your fixed costs are the same. That's $200,000 in your pocket. Yeah. Without having to add much labor, the overhead's fixed. So you're not really, you know, and that 50% flow through it takes into consideration your packaging costs and things of that nature. The other opportunity is third-party delivery. But that has turned out not to necessarily be a panacea for a lot of operators because the margins that these third-party yeah. delivery companies are charging are outrageous. However, when because of the relationships with we have with all these third-party delivery companies, we're able to negotiate a much, much better deal than most independents can get on their own just because we have such mass quantity of, of, of customers that we bring to them. So um, if you're not in that business, you need to re really rethink you know, your commitment to off-premise dining and catering and takeout because that's the future. Yeah. The other thing that's kind of interesting. Real right quick now, before you get to the other thing, yeah. what are some third-party deliveries that you think are doing it right that we should be looking at? You know, a lot of it's regional. You know, you've got your Grubhubs, your DoorDash, you've got your Postmates, you've got Uber Eats. You've Favor got, you, in Texas, I know. Yeah, a lot of it's, you know, there are regional players out there. And it has, it has its challenges. I, I want you to know that it's, uh, from f the food safety component of it to who shows up with the food, you know, are the, they representing your brand well? Exactly, is the food stacked? Meaning that you know they pick up three different deliveries and then they start delivering your food. So if you were the first person they picked up and you're the last person they just delivered, it could be hours. It could be. Yeah, it could be an hour. And you're, in the meantime, you know, you're you know you're hungry. You want to eat now. Yeah. That's the whole idea. Of you want convenience. I don't think that's going to go away. You know, I think what's going to happen is that that's going to be some consolidation. Um, operate these uh, these third party deliveries are going to you know they're going to start to consolidate and they're going to have to absorb each other. Well, they're going to have to become more competitive, um, and I think these rates will come down a little bit, but not a whole lot because they still have to pay drivers. They still have to pay. They still have a cost of doing business, but the platform, the idea of third party delivery, uh, isn't going away. So, um, but where we would focus our efforts in is is off premise catering, meaning drop off to offices homes, so on and so forth, businesses, that's where the money is. So what's the best way to break into that approach of catering? Well, you need a plan. You need, you need a catering strategy. You need a catering menu. Just because you, your current menu that you have it does not, not necessarily have to be your catering menu. An example would be if you're a steakhouse, okay? Well, your catering menu really doesn't work, you know, because you're selling steaks. Yeah. But if you're a great brand, a, a trusted brand, you could have a catering menu that's separate from your core menu, mm -hmm. okay? If you're in the market that... You know, if you're closed for lunch, because most steakhouses might be, uh, you could still have an, a very aggressive catering menu that's more sandwich and salad centric, gotcha. right? But it's on brand. Gotcha. So, um, and then uh, having the catering menu, having food photography to sort of support it, having online ordering, which is uh, critical uh, so that people can, so you make it easy. What about third party catering outlets? We talked about delivery for like <coughs> one off orders, but is there like a, a website out there that's, Owning it to like help people can like caterers connect with business that you can rec think of. Well, there's a company that um, we're familiar with. I think, I think it's called Deliver It. They're one. Uh, they're I think they're national. Postmates. Uh, these people uh, have a different model than uh, current delivery. It's just a flat fee. It's not uh, how Uber Eats. Not the, it's not the Uber Eats model. Got you. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can make money in catering, off premise dining should be top of mind because that's newfound income. Got you. Okay, moving on to number six, labor costs. Or sorry, yeah, labor costs. So labor is the Achilles heel for most operators. Most operators can control food costs to a certain degree. But labor is the problem. One, it's the cost of labor, minimum wage, especially in California. The cost of labor, finding labor, people that want to work as servers or cooks, okay, being able to keep and retrain, retrain, retain labor, yeah. and then the cost of training, yep. okay? And then there's just the cost of turnover. So building that team, the right, getting the right hires is really quite important. 
So most operators that we run into, and again, uh, we've probably done about over 2,000 assessments over the course. We do 80 projects a year. So uh, we're restaurants all over the world all the time. Um, oftentimes what happens is managers, they throw more labor at the problem as opposed to stepping back and really analyzing the problem. So just like in food costs, we really should have a true labor cost uh, based on um, sales per hour or based on um, what our true cost of labor is based on our production. So where the big cost of labor is in the back of the house, many states have uh, tip credit, okay? So they're paying servers maybe under $3 an hour because they're making tips. California um, just rolled out, I think in January, the ability where you can do share tips. So if you're in the West Coast, that's a big, big idea because now you're paying somebody $15 an hour, they could be getting as much as $4 or $5 an hour in tip share, so now you're $20 yeah. an hour. That makes a, a huge difference, it makes, you know, it makes your model uh, pretty interesting. So if you are on the West Coast and you can do that, you should, you should definitely be thinking about all of our clients have moved to sh uh, sharing tips for the back of the house because the dishwasher is just as important as anybody yeah. else. It's, on, there's been a huge indifference there. Sorry, I cut you short, I apologize. Yeah, no, it's just, the, it's the reality is that you know in, when the dishwasher walks off because you know he's he's working too hard he's only one person there should be two you know who's going to wash those dishes mm -hmm. so if you can uh, you know share tips with the dishwasher show them a little love a little respect they're working just as hard as everybody else in a different way yeah so labor is one of those things that operators really need to get their arms around so what we teach is that if you're paying a cook, let's say $15 an hour, with benefits, let's say $3, you know, 23%, yeah, it's roughly $18 an hour, well, that's 30 cents a minute. And that's how you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's 30 cents a minute. Whether they're scratching their head, they're checking their iPhone, they're going to the bathroom, they're shooting the breeze, 30 cents, 30 cents, 30 cents. So that becomes a big number. So what we help operators to see is ways to shave pockets of minutes of times yes. by creating greater efficiencies. So if I can eliminate 240 minutes, okay, of labor in your restaurant, which I do all the time. So 240 minutes, okay, is four hours of labor. Well, you take four hours of labor, okay, uh, times, uh, uh, you know, 365 so 60 60 times four five, times uh, yeah. 30 cents. It, it adds up to over $26,000 a Damn. year just in four hours of labor. That goes boom, yeah. right to the bottom line. Yeah. So the operator really needs to take a look and really watch what's going on. And there's some real low-hanging fruit. There's things like close to open. So when the restaurant closes at night and then when they uh, the cooks, everything goes back to the station, to the station's ready to open in the morning. So when the cooks come in in the morning, it's not like the hunt for Red October. I got to go look for everything. They waste a half an hour right out of the shoot just fetching. Yeah, okay, so just fetching. Look, yeah, and I say this all the time. We always, we always look out uh, but the, the, I think the trick is to look into what we're doing every day that we can do better. And that's where the secret is. How can we do every little thing better to be more efficient? What are your thoughts on that? I see you making There are so many tools out there, whether they're labor savings tools. You know, we use, we're, we're a big fan of things like hot schedules, yes. you know, which is a great tool for managing labor. I'm so happy you're getting into this. Yeah. But there are also, you know, simple tools, you know, uh, for dicing and slicing uh, onions and tomatoes, which, you know, in certain restaurants, if they do a high volume of, you know, to, it's very labor intensive. Remember, 30 cents a minute. When you're in the kitchen, <laughs> your listeners, when they're in the kitchen looking at what's going on, just look around yeah. and you start thinking to yourself, 30 cents a minute, 30 cents yes. a minute. That is the reality. And if you can shave 240 minutes, that's basically uh, uh, 120 minutes maybe in the morning shift and 120 minutes in the evening shift. You can consolidate, do a little compression, do a little creative scheduling. Boom. That is, yeah. that's that's $26,000 a yeah. year. Bottom line, time is money, right? Is. Time is money. And I think a lot of people, uh, I always try to encourage people to look to the technology to adopt in their business, to plug into, like, to, why create a system when you can plug a system in that was built by experts to do one thing really well? You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. A lot of people don't justify spending the money on that thing. Well, that's going to be an extra $30 a month. But how many how many hours are you going to save a month by having this efficient streamlined process? And that's right. the way you got to think about it. You have to have a you have to have a big picture idea. Oftentimes many operators are in the weeds. They're, you know, they're 
they're struggling to survive. So spending any money at all is without seeing like a like a ten x return. Yeah, you know, it's hard. To, it's hard for them to justify. Yeah. It. But if you don't get these best practices in place and start using tools, it's going to make it more and more challenging and difficult to run the restaurants because um, automation and technology is a and data is critical to being able to make good business decisions. Yes, we still got two more to get through. We're doing good. Number seven, food cost. Talk to me. So food cost is one of those things that it always surprises me. Whenever we go into restaurants, I'm always amazed that most people do not really know what their true food cost is. They basically take their cost of, of their purchases and they divide that by their sales, but they don't really know how to value their inventory. And the problem with that is that you're not getting a true food cost, okay? You could have 10000 or let's say $5,000 in inventory that's not really properly costed out. So the problem is, is that most restaurants do not have accurate recipes with yields because if you don't know what the yield is on the recipe, then how do you cost it out? Exactly. So you cost per ounce, per, cost per pound, whatever the case may be. So they're flying blindly, and that's a problem. Now, for us, the way we like to look at things is we look at it, the gap. The gap... It, it's not a clothing store. <laughs> the, the gap is the, is the variance between your, th your theoretical and your actual, okay? And we manage the gap. I don't really care if it's 26 or 27 or, or 20, 28. What I want to know is what should it be? What's my theoretical? If I have accurate food costing and I do a menu mix based on the things that I sold, then my theoretical should be 28%, okay? But if I'm running 31%, Okay, there's a three point gap. Okay, that's a problem. Now, most restaurants, even if the best run, best run, best run restaurants, be about a half a point gap. The average is about three quarters of a point. But if you're a point and a half, a point, point and a half, or north of that, you've got serious problems. You have to really dig in and start doing food costs or doing inventory more frequently. Who knows whether it's over portioning. Okay. A lot of times restaurants don't have portion control tools. Yep. They don't weigh things. A lot of times they have these old broken down scales versus digital scales. And when you're paying a dollar fifty an ounce for let's say filet mignon and you are off an ounce and a half, an ounce and a half, uh, a buck and a half, I should say, um, on the plate or in cost of goods translates to almost four dollars on the menu. Yeah. So not having scales, not having portion control tools. Um, not doing inventory, Honest employees, <laughs> keeping the keeping the back door locked, yeah. having a, a beat cage if yep. you're in a if you're in a steakhouse concept because it's unfortunate. But you know, um, we we have sometimes meat has legs; it walks away. It's they, weird. And, and <laughs> shrimp. I've never yeah. seen shrimp with legs, but they do. Yeah. Exactly. I think what you have to do is you have to uh, eliminate temptation. So you have to do. I call this being brilliant yeah. with the basics. If you can't manage to keep the back door locked, to keep the meat cooler locked, or, or meat cage. And do inventory properly. Uh, I think you know you have problems, yeah, and, and I, they won't resolve themselves. I think another one that I see, or I think might be, and feel free to correct me because you're the expert. Um, the, a lot of people don't really offer a great meal plan to like their employees. Like you get like a fifty percent or whatever. When you don't offer your your employees something to eat, and they're hungry, they're gonna eat it. You know what I mean? They're gonna they're gonna pull from like the line or whatever, go to the walk-in and eat something. So I think, you know, being able to like, if you offer something and having a system for that, at least then you can track it, you can expense it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it's in, you know exactly where your money is going. How do you right. feel about that? Well, I think that's a great idea if you can, if you can pull it off and execute it. Like there are brands that, that have that culture, like Fleming's, for example, they always have a, a pre-shift meal. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is what it is. It's you know salad. It might be some type of a stew type dish, maybe some type of rice, but it allows people to eat together as a family. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it used to be yeah. back, you know, 30, 40, even 50 years ago. You know, the restaurant would close for lunch, and all the employees would have lunch together. Yep. Or before dinner, they would all get together. They would break bread. We'd have a good meal, and it was a way of bringing the team together. Well, we've sort of moved away from that. We don't do that very often, but I think. Uh, being able to offer it at certain times of the day, <coughs> excuse me, um, is a way to help really build that company culture, build that team, and show your custom, show your employees, your internal customers, that you really care about them. Yes, awesome. So this is our last bullet, uh, number eight, marketing. What do you got? I mean, that's a broad topic right there. I don't know how you're going to sew this one up into a sweet little delivery. Well, marketing. Um, requires a game plan in terms of what it, what is it we're trying to accomplish? 
we need a strategy, okay? We need a marketing plan, okay? Marketing is not just posting things on Instagram, okay? That's like, that's basic. But we need a marketing plan in terms of who we're going after, how we, how we want to think about promotions, knowing, building out a, a marketing calendar, meaning that, okay, we just did, um, for our client up in Portland, we did this amazing Valentine's Day, three-day promotion for them because people don't always eat on Valentine's Day, they'll eat the day before or day after. So we celebrated it for three days. We just celebrated National Margarita Day with them. This is our client, Jorge's uh, Tequila Factory, a Margarita Factory up in Portland. I'm surprised nobody's done a, a special around Corona beers yet. No, but we just had, <laughs> so, you know, National Guacamole Day is yeah, coming up. Right? So what we do is we build out a calendar of all of these events, and then we celebrate those events, and we market those events, and then we have reasons for you to come for those events, whether it be a promotion. We don't want a discount. Marketing, discounting is the kiss of death. Mm. Okay, Why is uh, that? Because once you start it, it becomes toxic. And then people only come to you when you have a discount. You attract the wrong type of guests. Right. Well, they don't. They only come when you're giving something away. Yeah. We don't want to give things away. We want to promote other things mm -hmm. and create value. Mm. So marketing is really important. Now, also part of marketing is, you know, every restaurant... They, most restaurants, it's a love-hate relationship with Yelp, okay? It is what it is. But if you have a, a, if you're not a four, if you're below a four, you've got issues. You need to have your Yelp reputation cleaned up. Yeah, that I'm looking at four point five personally. That that's what my my bar is. Yeah, I like you know whenever I see four or better, you know four point two, four point three, and north, it's hard to get four point five. You really have to be, yeah. you have to really be killing it all the time there's in terms of service. Always that super unreasonable person that's going to give you a one because it happens. There's a hair in the food, which I mean, it happens. It happens at the best restaurant. Happens. Yeah. But if you're not really focusing on that Yelp score, as much as you may hate them, there's probably some truth there. Okay. And there are people that take advantage of help. They're trying to get a free bail or, you know, they're, they're, they're pandering, whatever the case may be. But it's a good, honest barometer. So Yelp is one of those things that, you know, it's one of those, it's a love hate. You know, if you've got great scores, you're, you're in love with them. But if you have some bad scores, you need to get on top of that or bad reviews and fix that right away. What's the best way to get on top of it? Well, you need to respond to it immediately. You cannot just suck it up and just ignore it. You should reach out to those people and, and you know, uh, show some empathy. That I'm sorry you had a bad experience. It's not the it's not it's not our the way we normally execute. It's some you know I can't make any excuses for it, but I apologize and I really would like to invite you to come back in again and give us another shot because we value your business and we know we can do better. Yeah. So by reaching out to that that customer, you know you can negate that they will eliminate it because you showed them the fact that hey you showed some empathy but the fact that they spent their hard money they didn't have a great experience they didn't get any love food was cold you know all the things that are kind of critical to creating a great guest experience awesome again we just covered the eight ways to be more profitable in your restaurants i'll cover those one more time brand positioning guest experience management uh, sorry, management team and execution of strategy, menu innovation, off-premise catering, labor costs, food costs, and marketing. Dean Small, thank you so much, man. This has been a lot of fun covering these things. Uh, we wrap. Are there any other last thoughts you want to get? Any other things before we say goodbye? You know, I think that this is a a, a great industry, and uh, if you take care of your team, okay, and show them the love and the, the fact that you really care about them. I look at it sort of like the Southwest model. You know, you'll, your your people will take care of your guests, mm. and they will deliver. They'll be happy, and when you have happy, when you have happy internal customers, which is your employees, that translates really well to the guest, and it helps them deliver a, a memorable guest experience, and that's what drives frequency. Beautiful, I love it. So we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. Who's one person, and I know you know a lot of successful people in this industry, who's one person you respect and admire and you believe would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today? You know, my very first client when I started Synergy was a gentleman uh, by the name of Alan Palmieri. And Alan is the Executive Vice President of Operations for Urban Plates. Okay. You know, he was with Darden, with Red Lobster. Um, he's been with some very impressive brands over the years. Uh, he's a hell of a nice guy. Great operator, great mentor, great coach. 
he would be uh, he would be a great contributor to your podcast. And where is Alan located? San Diego. Alan, look out! I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show and I let the folks at home know how can we connect with you. Um, maybe we're interested in your services. I know you got some courses and some programming that you're creating about to launch, or you just have launched. You want us to know about those? Yeah, we're we're so excited. We, we you know. We've taken the, the best of the best learnings over the years of, of consulting, and we've created Synergy U, which is a Synergy um, online management training program that will certify you to be a to, to really be able to be a great manager. And if you're certified as a, as Synergy through our program, um, uh, not only will you be able to, I think be able to demand more money as a manager because you just know how to run the restaurant better, you'll make the operator more money. Um, but our online training programs, I think, are, are really going to be terrific. We're super excited about that. And they can reach me at uh, dean at synergyconsultants.com, or they can just go to our website. We have a tremendous amount of content, and they can sign up for our newsletter. Our newsletter is packed with um, great insights, white papers, and on-trend information from our travels because we do a lot of international travel. And we see things all the time that uh, we, we love to share our knowledge and information with uh, our fellow colleagues in the industry. Beautiful. And I should say, um, the reason why Dean is here uh, is not because they reached out to me. I reached out to them. And I reached out to them because uh, one of somebody I know and respect, Colton Schultz, past guest in the show, Grand Junction Subs, maybe yeah, you're familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Colton has nothing but amazing things to say about you and your team. And that's why I sought you guys out to get you on the show. So uh, it's a trusted brand. These guys will take care of you if you look if you, if you you look to hire them and uh, you got my seal of approval. So awesome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to sit with me, to share your story and this in-depth series of knowledge that you just dropped on us. Uh, there is no questioning, Dean. You are unstoppable. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Hope that I was able to uh, enlighten your, uh, your podcast uh, listeners and wishing you all the best. Thank you again. It was great. My pleasure. Cheers. Cheers, man.